we stay within um, within that realm. So please welcome back on stage Andre Pitic from Fitbit. Um, so as you, as you've like had him talk earlier, I had to apologize for him because apparently we stole him two minutes on the timer and kicked him off stage a bit too early. So um, I I do apologize for that. Um, so we'll make sure that like during this uh, session that he's moderating, we'll make sure he gets like some of the time back. Um, but I hope like, you got all of the learnings that you want out of that. So please give a big round of applause to welcome Andre back on stage, who's going to announce this panel that he's moderating. So please give a big round of applause, and then maybe he's coming out. <laughs> see, see, seems he's uh, paying me back by, st st um, by him, him, me stealing him two minutes. He's now just like waiting us, making us wait for two minutes, it seems like. But I know that we had like some people to get like hooked up. So. Um, I hope we'll have that set up in a second. But wh while, while we're doing that, um, I want to, yeah, there we have him. Okay, Andre, thank you very much. So, hello everybody. I like the other setup a lot better. I mean, the other speaker could see you. No, I cannot see you. Uh, but I think that's fair. So, I'd like to introduce uh, uh, our panel today. Uh, Mihaela Urzika, Strategy Corporate Development and the Investor Relations Director at OMV Petrom. Vic Victoria Albrecht, Managing Director at Springbook AI. John Gale, Co-Founder and CEO of XSS. Come on, Shane. And Delia Ilasa, Commercial Director at Medicover. The theme today is how do big companies innovate and how do big companies work with startups to innovate and to, you know, to bring their uh, big corporate structure to a new place and to face the ever-changing uh, landscape of, uh, of the business today. Um, I'm going to start with, uh, with, a, with, with a question for the two big corporations that we have on stage. Uh, and, uh, you know, how do corporations innovate today? What is your preferred way of interacting with startups and how do you do that? Thank you, Andre, for the question. So I believe uh, from a big corporations, the innovation capability is one of the most important these days. And uh, I see it from, a three, from three different perspectives. On all of them, collaboration with startups helps and may fundamentally create the differentiators that the company looks for. So the first one would be to be able to generate innovative output. So from the resources that we have, continuously transform them into skills and ideas in new products, new processes, new systems, ultimately for the benefit of the firm and the shareholders. The second one would be from the perspective of using the skills and the knowledge to be able to exploit at maximum and um, transform the existing technologies and being able to produce new ones. And the third one will be the capacity to continuously exploit and implement new ideas better and faster than competitors. So on all three, startups could help us and uh, influence our ultimate value that we sought. What, uh, you know, what does a healthcare provider think about it? So. Hello, first of all. We, we are in an industry that is very traditional, just as OMV Petrom. So the, the reality is that there is, it's being said the fact that this decade, the one starting in 2020, will be the decade when healthcare will be uh, massively disrupted. So we are looking at things that um, will help us, yeah, um, achieve our goals in, in the future. As uh, my, uh, our CEO just mentioned in an earlier panel, we have been delivering healthcare in the same way for decades. 
So right now we need to raise up our game and, and change something if we want to still be relevant and still be here in decades to come. What is the single most important thing that you need to change? So first of all, uh, we're looking at uh, shifting to from from uh, the perspective that we used to have, you know, the, the professional-centric to the uh, customer-centric perspective. So um, I think uh, the, the main things that we're looking at and doing now are um, uh, evolving around the customer, or, yeah? Um, uh, shifting the paradigm from the patient to the customer and looking at the person as a customer until they enter the doctor's room and becoming a patient to the doctor in the doctor's room. Because as long as we will be, I don't know, I, I may use the word condescendent, condescendent, you know, looking at him from up, uh, we won't be able to deliver the care that healthcare stands for. So what we're doing now is that we, uh, we are um, looking at two, two ways, two uh, streams of innovation and uh, we, we are um, initiating projects, yeah, so trying to be more uh, efficient in our processes, and that's one, one way. And uh, the other way is looking at whatever happens out there, and that's what we're doing here, looking at what happens in the technology world and trying to attract and become a test environment for some startups that might need a real-life um, uh, test environment. That, that, that's great, and uh, you know, for full disclosure, I'm uh, the co-founder of Innovation Labs, that's a pre-accelerator for students that's now in five cities. It's the biggest one in Romania, and uh, it's in Cluj as well. And the Medicover is the first year when they're partners with us, and uh, when they patron the third year, and there's going to be some questions around it. Uh, but this is, I mean, it's a, you know, uh, it's a uh, national platform for, for, uh, for startups. Uh, however, we have here with us on stage one of the co-founders, of uh, F Success, which is a global platform. So, Sean, what is your perspective? I mean, you know, hearing how these big companies, uh, you know, think about the innovation. What, what is, uh, you know, your perspective? Uh, it's, it's, uh, can you guys hear me? Is this on? Switch to this one. Great. Perfect. Um, <coughs> thank you. Um, it, it's been a, it's been a really uh, fun journey for corporate innovation um, since F Success started in 2011, and and we've really um, almost come full circle in many ways. And, and I'll describe what that means. Um, so corporates have the kinds of problems that Michela and, and Delia are describing. And, and they're very important issues that traditionally were dealt with in, in one of two ways. They were called digital transformation, if they were more about saving the company money uh, or, uh, or improving the operations of the company. And they were called innovation if they were sort of in this funky land of, uh, how do I do different things that my organization doesn't know how to do already? Um, so in 2011, when F Success started, um, corporates were really a very small part of it um, and grew over the next few years through the open innovation ecosystem. And open innovation is essentially uh, putting up an application, um, asking any startup to show up and, and apply, going through them, running a program, delivering value that way, which, which is fantastic, right? I'm for anything that delivers value to a startup founder. Um, but at the end of the day, what's happened over the last few years is corporates have grown up, and they've kind of come back to that pre-2011 world, and we're seeing the rebirth of closed innovation. Um, and it doesn't mean that open innovation goes away or doesn't have value. It has tremendous value. But if we look amongst the 4,000 corporates that use F-Success for corporate innovation, in addition to whatever open innovation they're doing, they're starting to double down on closed innovation and using things like scouting and needs platforms and all these new methodologies are coming out that are really exciting about how you identify a need. Even if you, if you don't know what the need is, especially if it's at a business unit, because we're driving back further into the corporation with, the, with, with closed innovation, how do you help the business unit understand what their need is and articulate it? And then rather than finding 1,000 startups or 2,000 startups to evaluate, the way many people do for open innovation on F-Success, which again is fantastic, it's another tool, just finding the two startups or the one startup that'll make that business unit happy, deliver value to the startup, because if you don't deliver value to the startup, it won't work anyways, deliver value to the business unit, and then deliver a contract or an acquisition or all the other things that F-Success's 4,000 corporate innovation clients do. So super exciting time, very excited to see what comes next and uh, a lot of demand and a lot more involvement and value being delivered from the corporate community into the startup community. Excellent, excellent, thanks a lot. And uh, I mean, you know, companies can innovate with startups, but they can also innovate with, uh, uh, you know, very uh, 
focused consultancies, and uh, AI is one of the greatest, you know, the biggest subjects, and I think one of the biggest potential in the future. So we have Victoria, who's the managing partner of Primbok AI, and how does a company like yours approach working with big companies in, uh, is it, you know, how, how, how do you do it? I mean, wh what's the secret? Sure, uh, it's a great question, and I think uh, the first thing to note is that um, every uh, not every country, every company um, is at a different stage in its AI journey. Um, so for some companies, AI is already a huge priority, and they have a whole machine learning team uh, developing software. And for other companies, they're very much at the beginning of their journey, and they don't yet um, they don't yet have that priority. They haven't yet understood what AI can bring to their business. Um, so it's the first step for us is to understand where are they along that journey and how can we help bring the necessary stakeholders on, on the same page um, and help them understand what are the opportunities within their business, and also given uh, the data that they have available. Um, you can only really apply machine learning when you have the right data, um, and sometimes that means we need to do a lot of pre-processing to the data to get it to the state where we can then work with it, but it's understanding what's available in terms of data, what does the company want to achieve in terms of outcomes and KPIs, and then finding a way to align, align the two. So um, oftentimes we start with um, really quite basically um, a workshop, um, helping them um, understand what are the fundamentals of AI, how does it work, what are uh, different machine learning methodologies, um, then working out use cases, and then going into several proposals. Um, and I think the really exciting thing about um, software in general, but also very specifically machine learning software, is that you can create a very um, direct plan for what the return on invest is of that software. Um, and also, if you build software on a machine learning basis, then it's, it's, it's software that's really sustainable in and of itself. You don't need to rebuild the software in two or three years. It learns with new incoming data. Um, and I think that's re what's really exciting for companies. Thank you. So uh, we've you know, set the stage. Now I'd like to go you know, a little bit more specific. So and, uh, at, at the end, I will ask you to tell the startups maybe in, in, uh, in here how they can approach you and what they can gain from that, uh, from that interaction. But you know, think about it, but don't answer right now. Right now, I'm gonna, I, I, I'd like to go a little bit deeper in like, give me some examples. Like what changed, for instance, and I'll start again with uh, OMP Petrom and uh, you know, with Innovation Labs, you have uh, three years. What, what are uh, the, the things that you've seen changing and what, what are the things that you know you remember from this uh, participation in this program from this three years journey when we started with an experiment i think in 2017 participating in the hackathon to the recent times of today when we are very proudly collaborating with one of the startups called electronic tools and i believe they are here in the audience so they help us build a system called gastro efficiency system which is a system that um, helps us managing the kitchen of the gas filling stations in OMV branded filling stations. So what it exactly does is um, supporting the employees in the kitchen to apply the standard. So it gives them an automatic tool that augments the uh, processing of the forms and reports and actually labeling each food item in the kitchen that is very important to have the accurate hour dates and time um, yeah so in this collaboration the objectives were to streamline the raw material management and the fresh products then to automate the process and reduce the manual filling errors ultimately giving us a better management tool and control over the gastro business and the stage is that we have the architecture design so the technical teams and the guest filling station teams have put together the needs the hardware has been tested we have the proposal received approved the design the concept and we are now in the budget approval phase with the business unit so this gives the startup the scalability because we have 150 filling stations that may use this system that's excellent so you really found uh, like innovation that you could apply. Yes. Would you say that, I mean, I've, you know, I've met some of the great people from OMV Petrom who interacted with the program, like six or seven people. Would you say that, uh, you know, they also, you know, are changing or they are bringing some change into the organization? Would you yes. say that or not? Sure, so uh, of the learnings of this collaboration, 
I would start with the first one. For a company like us to be part of a program that puts together academia, entrepreneurs, so tech companies, opens a wide space of collaboration yeah, for everyone involved in the project. The second one is from a company that is in an industry that has over 160 years of experience. We feel proud to be able to work with a startup, to be able to implement new ideas, uh, do fast thinking and um, benefit of this. And we also took humbly the learnings that some due diligence processes need to be adjusted because usually the startups do not have all the ISOs and uh, multiple year background. So we also learned to be a bit more agile and flexible in our thinking and people along have been uh, on the journey of adjusting their mindset from this collaboration, so. And, uh, yeah, and, you know, turning over to Delhi, I mean, I know it's, it, it's, the, first, it's the first year. Do you, do you have, what are your personal takeaways from, uh, from, uh, from this program? I mean, I, you were in the jury and you saw... So, first of all, I loved the experience. I was kind of familiar with what you did but I was never involved in, in uh, the um, process before. So for me, it was uh, all a first. So I, I really enjoyed it as an individual. And uh, just to, to pick it up from where, from where you left, I think in order to, to have a, a viable product, in order to really have value from this kind of, of programs, you need to have a very determined sponsor. So within the company, within the large company, you need to have a leader, the leader, really sponsoring and taking on the idea and embracing it because otherwise uh, there is this gap, as I, as, as I call it, between the expectations of the large company and the expectations of the, of the startup. And putting them together, so um, uh, the first, the large company has processes and uh, uh, due diligence uh, that is lengthy, that is um, uh, time consuming and uh, resource consuming and is very often very difficult to understand for, for a startup, for a founder, for a young entrepreneur. So uh, we, we really tried to, to get the mindset, and actually that's some of the, of the value that we're looking in such a program. We, l we really want to learn from them. So it's not, it's not all about the positioning where we, the big company, are the, the, the um, uh, trendsetter or the one leading the process. We are learning from them. And uh, within the program, we were amazed to see the ideas. Yeah, we, we did work and coached one of, of the teams. We also awarded in the, in the demo day uh, another team that is here that I'm actually going to see later on in, in our booth. And um, we're trying to find ways to work. But we also took it further because uh, we do have in our, in our booth um, a startup that is helping us launch uh, the, new, the new service, which is Medicover Express. And uh, we actually started working with them a few weeks ago, and we're already able to, to test the product. So that's something that in a large company is not very easy to find. And yeah, that, that's very beautiful. And uh, you know, when we stop learning from people who are younger than us, I think that we're uh, history. So, uh, uh, but a lot of it, I mean, uh, I, I'm pretty sure that not every startup that would you know, knock at your door would get the door open. So, one of the reasons that Innovation Labs exists is to put together and to, be, to create a little bit of trust between the you know, big companies and small companies. So you know, we have a lot of people who are looking at those startups and those people. How, does, uh, how, can we, how did you scale this? I mean, how did you scale the trust to the next level where you, know, you have a platform that gives this trust? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so we, uh, we see all of the the millions of transactions, if you will. And a transaction on F-Success could be a uh, corporate acquiring a startup, which happens many times a year through, through what we do in corporate innovation, a corporate giving a contract, um, a corporate delivering a program, uh, tech do, stars do you accepting check the startups? Do you check their startups? Do you have so a process? There, there, there's two stages of it, really. W one is creating a community where the startup feels they have identity and the corporate has identity. And at the end of the day, when you have identity, you have to have trust because socially, you know that it's visible in some way and you, you, you know each other. The counterparties are clear. It's, uh, you, you can't just ghost a startup or ghost a, a corporate without consequences. So the, the community is very important and reputation is important 
because these are repeated iterations of, of contacts people have. And the F6S platform does that for millions of, of connections and applications and data transfers um, each year. The, uh, the part that relates to closed innovation, which, uh, which is what we've been spending a lot of time on, um, starts more with selfish benefit. So trust, I would argue, in this world of corporate innovation is, is based on what's in it for me. And I'd almost reverse the name of this panel almost, you know, what, what, what can startups deliver, uh, what can corporates deliver to startups? Exactly. Um, because at the end of the day, if there's not something the startup can get out of it, which isn't a conversation or getting up on stage or any of those things, because a, a, a good smart startup that's later stage, which are the only startups, by the way, that will scout now for corporates okay. because we don't believe there's, a, there's benefit to the early stage ones, um, doesn't need those things. They need a contract, they need revenue, Correct. they want to get acquired. Um, so what's the benefit to the startup? And then what's the benefit to the corporate? And, and I, I really enjoyed what Delia said, for example, because if there's not a, a stakeholder, if there's not someone in a business unit, which we're increasingly seeing in this stage of closed innovation, that can actually deliver that value and has been pre-vetted inside the organization to deliver that value, then the corporate can't say selfishly, I need this. This is going to do something for me. Um, so trust, in my mind, and in everything we do, is based on the mutual benefit of what's going to happen. On the platform side, which is a really good question, um, it's a developing area. So this is a very immature market in the same way that accelerators were, were immature in 2011 when F Success started and, and served that community. Uh, the corporate innovation market has gatekeepers, so it has innovation managers, it has people in business units, it has very few startups that you want to feed into it in the closed innovation model. Um, there are other people that need visibility. Um, if you don't have C-level support for an innovation program, it's, it's not going to go anywhere, unfortunately. It's one of the hard facts of, of corporate innovation still. It's not an established area yet. Um, so what we're working on is, and, and we have many large Fortune 500, global 500 startups using this platform already, um, is a platform that pushes into the corporate where every business unit lead can post what they need. And we talked about the, hey, I know what I want, I don't know what I want cases, and you need to allow for both of those. Um, and expose it, and the people that are the gatekeepers, the people that are the, uh, the, the innovation managers, can use that to build support amongst the different BUs to highlight success to feed startups more easily into the organization. So we call it the corporate innovation portal, and I believe there'll be a lot more innovation outside of F Success as well, of other organizations that are delivering these things as we scale it and it becomes larger. We're already seeing the stress with many innovation managers and, and R&D leads, um, where we scale it beyond the human relationships that currently underlie most corporate innovation. Yeah, no, I, I think that, I mean, either you have people inside of corporations that are innovation managers, or you then have to have uh, some sort of, uh, you know, ambassador for, for innovation or somebody who wants to take on, you know, that role uh, anyway. So, but, you know, as you said, I mean, trust and reputation is, uh, is very important. So how does, uh, you know, how does uh, Springbok AI, uh, how did you approach, uh, you know, being trustworthy? You know, how did you build up reputation? You were a startup at the beginning, right? I mean, now you're a reputable company. How did you do that? Sure. Um, so, yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And, of course, every company, uh, no matter how big, started small at some point um, and had to gain that trust um, over time. Um, I think, to be honest, we were uh, quite lucky in that our very first client was a German multinational company, um, Henkel. Uh, so they produce, like, the washing powder parasol or uh, Loctite glue, if any of you guys like to glue stuff at home. Um, so, uh, yeah, they... the 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 relationship that we built with them was actually a trust relationship from the very beginning. And um, some, some people might be <laughs> shaking, shaking their heads as to how the both sides um, ended up starting to work together, but we started working without the contract in place already, um, and they started paying us uh, without the contract in place already. Um, and you know, as I'm sure you guys are very well aware, um, sometimes corporate processes are just extremely slow. Um, and if there's no basis of trust and if you need a contract in place to even start working together, then that trust isn't really there. I'm not saying everyone should go and start working without the contract signed, 
Um, but everyone should start working, working uh, from a basis that's of that's trust. That's not really legal in Romania, so I mean, usually. Say again? <laughs> that's not really legal in Romania. You have to have the contract and then start the work. That's how things work here, but I understand what I, you're I saying. Do, ideally, yeah. yes. Um, so to continue um, answering your question, I think once you've, to be honest, once you've had um, one large company trust you, and in our case, it, they trusted us with uh, quite a large and important uh, part of c their commercial data, um, then having conversations with other companies about uh, working with their data becomes much, much easier. Um, of course, uh, you know, we, we sort of trust by proxy a lot of the time. Um, so through that, we've been able to actually work exclusively uh, with enterprise clients. Um, but you know, it, it does require um, a certain amount of uh, a level of communication, a sincerity, um, and of course, also companies ask for references. You know, that's just something that we provide without necessarily being asked for it. Um, so I think being being consistent um, in your actions, following through on the things that you're saying, um, you know, those are small steps you can take to build trust on a personal, individual basis. And then there's that due diligence piece that we talked about earlier, um, and. That's a piece that, well, I think um, most companies have to go through. The easier they can make it, the better. You know, the, the e uh, easier those large companies can make that process, um, the better. But um, ultimately, there are um, rules and regulations in place. And um, we know this from, for example, one of our clients is um, a law firm called Hogan Levels. Um, and they're um, in, in the States, in Germany, um, lots of countries around the world. And in their contracts with their clients, they state that um, they need to have a, uh, any, any vendor that they work with that works with their client's data needs to fill a certain set of criteria. You mentioned ISO. Um, and so, of course, then that criteria is passed on to vendors. They need to fill that criteria in order to work with, that da with, that, with the data, data of the clients. Um, so that's something that we're on the receiving end of, of course. Um, but if we work with a company's internal data, then they have their own policies that aren't necesarily that strict. Um, so yeah, okay. it's, it's a case-by-case so case basis. You, you're not big enough so that you don't work with startups yet. I mean, you're at the stage when you are looking maybe to, to be bigger and uh, working with startups. But the other, uh, I'd like to, you know, we have three minutes left, and I'd like to get into a pitch mode. So we have two big corporates and one platform. What would you pitch to startups that might be in this, uh, uh, you know, let's start with, uh, with you. What would you pitch to the startups? Uh, the way I pitch it, I'll say, come work with us, help us be open to innovation and bring entrepreneurship, and we give you scale, brand, and investments. Okay. Okay, Delia, what would you pitch to startups? So, I think um, I'm going to be longer, a bit longer. Yes. So, uh, I think... Uh, one thing that is in our DNA as Romanians is the, um, the fear of failure. Yeah. So when I, when I first joined the company, I was pitched a, um, a culture where you can fail. Yeah. And uh, I've, uh, I've lived that for the past one and a half years in, in Medicover. And we are a company where we, li we test things. And uh, that's what I would pitch to them. Let's try together. Let's see if we can find a path to something great. Yeah. If not, maybe uh, we uh, we just uh, reroute and we try again. Thanks a lot, Sean. What would you pitch to startups? To startups? Yes, to startups now. Uh, what F6 does, F6S does at the end of the day is, uh, if you're a tech founder out there, uh, is we deliver the perfect connection that will enable you to get a contract, to get acquired, or to get your product in market, and wants to work with you, and can deliver the value that you need at your particular phase. So it's, it's a very personalized experience in a community of three million founders. Thanks a lot, John. So uh, would you pitch anything to, to startups, Victoria, I mean, right now? Or I mean, you're a you know, mature company that uh, Sure. So um, we do work. We do work with startups, but it's um, in, a, in a slightly different way. Um, so some of the work that we do is actually on behalf of um, investment firms or venture arms of corporates, um, and we do technical due diligence. Oh, okay. So a lot of companies now, uh, I'm sure, probably most of the companies out here today as well, um, love to talk about how they have AI in their product. Um, and the reality of what we found uh, through our work is that um, w with most companies. It's not actually AI. Um, it's a good buzzword to use. Um, it's uh, 
something that gets people's attention. It's something that investors love to hear. So, so, so you um, help investors do due diligence? Uh, yes, so we, okay. we help actually look, in, look under the hood and see what is actually what does actually the technology enable you to do? Um, what is the capability of the team? Can they actually deliver on their promises? Uh, kind of going forward, scaling the product. Um, so that's how we work with, with startups, but yeah, through, through investors and through uh, corporates. So, you know, you heard them. We have two big companies. We have oil and gas and healthcare that, you know, are waiting to be disrupted. We have a platform where you can meet with even more companies. And if you are into AI, you have somebody that you can partner with or, you know, that you'll probably have received as a diligence uh, checklist item uh, w w with your funding. And you also have uh, your host uh, who is, uh, you know, angel investor uh, that's looking forward to work with uh, startups. How would you pitch? What, what, how would I pitch? Uh, I pitch, I mean, I'm probably best uh, at... Uh, companies that are looking to get funded, that are looking for seed or round A, or at companies who uh, want to sell. I have experience selling to mostly American companies, so not necessarily European. So that's where I'm best uh, at. Uh, all the other parts uh, with, you know, scaling and all, all of these things, of course, that I have some ideas, but I'd like to help where I'm, uh, where I'm best so that I can best utilize my, my time. Uh, and I also invite uh, earlier stage startups to join Innovation Labs in Cluj or in Bucharest or wherever you are and meet with, uh, with these companies uh, here and then why not scale globally and then why not, you know, do AI. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, thanks to you uh, all. Thank you very much. Thank you.